Welcome to my Mastering of VMware's vSphere 6. We're dealing with Chapter 6 this week, Creating and Configuring Storage Devices. So pretty much this chapter is focusing on storing within vSphere, within vCenter. Not so much storage fundamentals. Uh, one thing I did learn doing my vCP is you need to understand uh, things like iSCSI and Fiber Channel a little bit more in depth than our book does talk about. So do, do some research on fiber channel, uh, the, what the nodes are called, like what's an F node, an E node, things, things like that, as well as iSCSI and how, how it works. So with that said, our author thought it would be kind of important to start off with a little uh, midbit. Although it is common industry joke to blame the network when things go wrong, I believe that getting a solid understanding of the underlying storage systems in your environment will save you many headaches down the road. Network is dealing with communication. More and more things are being laid on top of that infrastructure for communication. Storage is one of them. Storage does not have to be on the remote or does not have to be on the physical host. It can be on a remote storage device. And we can send commands, or specifically, we can send SCSI commands through a data network, through a TCP IP network. And what's that called? That's called iSCSI. That way, we can have a packet that actually is a collection of SCSI commands. We can then further uh, take that example and do things like a jumbo frame. That way, instead of sending a traditional MTU size of 1500 within a frame, we can do a 9000 MTU size frame, so four times larger, to help accommodate our storage requirements on the network. So the importance of our storage design is definitely the, uh, the advanced capabilities, things like high availability, uh, direct resource uh, scheduler, fault tolerance, things of that nature, better performance, better uh, recoverability, the overall performance of the VMs and vSphere cluster as a whole, allows us to oversubscribe, that's always a big thing, helps with things like availability. So availability is the overall availability of our virtual infrastructure. I've dealt with a company more recently where all VMs are stored locally on the physical servers. And so when a server goes down, even if they have an additional server to replace it, well, the data is on that server. So when a physical server goes down, they may lose the VMs. As opposed to centralizing their storage or using what's called shared storage, that way, all of the SXI hosts are connected to the same storage. That way, the processing of the VM is done on the SXI, but the storage of the VM is done on that centralized unit. Normally, you want to make sure that this unit is not going to be going down. Because if this is going to be your central point, you want to make sure that it's everything that you need it to be. For example, reliable, available, secure. You do not want to purchase this off of eBay. You want to make sure that this is going to be quality equipment, a enterprise class storage unit. Uh, I've dealt with companies where they literally, their SAN was a $400 SAN off of eBay. I've had some organizations where it literally was a, a Drobo, which was really great for small or medium offices, but not for this type of environment. Yes, there are instructions on how to do an iSCSI Drobo for this, but we're not going there. So with all the enterprise storage systems, a type of RAID is used. Not saying that all of them use RAID, but a type or version of RAID will be used. RAID is the redundant array of inexpensive or independent disks and there are different types of RAID. Normally we talk about RAID 0, 1, 5, and 6. 
uh, if you use some type of free software like uh, I'm trying to think of one free NAS that's what I was thinking of free NAS free NAS uses a specific type of raid that's unique to their environment Drobos use a specific type of raid so not every system uses raid but vast majority of them do so raid zero is a good uh, example that's where it spreads out two or more disks and let's for, uh, say for example we're using two disks raid zero will write half the data to each disk it provides really good performance but if one drive dies you lose everything if you uh, spread it out over four disks it writes a quarter of all information to each disk again one drive dies you lose everything raid one has we're going to use the example of two disks again we'll write a hundred percent copying to each basically what i copy to one is automatically copied to the other so if we do this as a collection of like two uh raid one and raid zero put together whatever we write to one writes to the other so we can actually have a raid zero array with our two primary disks let me let me get my pin going because i disagree with this slide so this could be our raid zero and those will be our raid one so RAID 0 will be these two disks, and the RAID, fun uh, RAID 1 will be the collection of those two disks. RAID 5 allows us to do three or more disks where we're allowed to use a uh, lose uh, one disk. Basically, a portion of the disk, 1 divided by n, n is the number of disks, we will lose that much space in, on each disk for parity. Here we have five disks. So 20% of each disk will be uh, set aside for parity. This is really good for bulk storage. RAID 6 does double parity. So you lose more raw disk space, but you can lose two drives. So there's some benefits. We have what's called a storage area network, or a SAN. Well, they were initially deployed to aggregate storage within a data center. They quickly became more than that. So vSphere offers several shared storage protocols, fiber channel, fiber channel over ethernet, iSCSI, NFS. NFS is a form of a network attached storage where iSCSI and fiber channel and its variants are a direct storage link there will be storage questions on your vcp exam you need to know storage plain simple you need to know fiber channel over ethernet you need to know fiber channel you need to know iSCSI i'm preparing videos on storage so if you want view that material to get a more in-depth understanding of storage so vSphere storage options, here we have fiber channel, we have fiber channel uh, switches, we have a fiber channel LUN, and we have a fiber channel connection. What gets really funny is they don't talk about the different port connectors, and that's what you really need to know. So here is a great example. We need to know what an in port is, an F port, an E port, an NL port, FL port, and a G port. G port is a generic port. An N port is a node port, which is used to transmit and receive fiber channel data frames in a switched environment, N port. A F port is a port on a switch that the N port connects to. E port is the expansion port, which is the port on a switch that has another switch plugged into it, basically between switches. The node loop port transmits and receives fiber channel frames in a private looping environment. So those are the big ones. You need to know N, F, and E. 
I think there's only one or two questions on my VCP that dealt with them, but you should know what they are. Next, we have what's called zoning. Because we're still dealing with fiber channel, we can do multi or single initiated, multi or single target. So we can actually zone how our storage is going to be connecting to our hosts. We could zone per port, we could zone per hosts, we could do a combination of the two. So fiber channel over ethernet basically is an ethernet connection or an ethernet frame that packages fiber channel traffic. And it's sent over an ethernet frame. Here we have iSCSI, which is again, an ethernet frame, an IP packet, a TCP packet, and then we actually have an iSCSI payload. This is a SCSI command sent through an IP packet. This uses the same infrastructure that a data network would use, so you would not need to have any specialized fiber channel equipment. Here we have again, it uses a traditional switched environment, and let's assume this is all iSCSI. All you have to do is enable iSCSI on the hosts and the SAN, and that's it. If we're talking NFS, that's a network file system. This will be more of a NAS, network attached storage. So it's storage that's directly attached on the network. Can we virtualize our equipment? Sure. We can actually have a virtualized SAN on each machine. The requirement is a combination of an SSD and a hard drive on each of our hosts. That allows us to span our virtual SAN data store on multiple ESXi hosts. Moving on, let's talk about how we create and configure storage devices. So vSphere uses a proprietary file system called VMFS, VMware's Virtual Machine File System. This is a, uh, the base configuration of the base file system that VMware uses, just it is. It's similar to NTFS and uh, the EX, EXT3 for Linux. It's designed to be clustered file systems for its inception. Neither NTFS nor EXT is a clustered file system, so there are some things where VMFS does kind of exceed, but there's other type of file system. The important part here is being able to cluster the file system uh, natively, that way it's expandable and it's scalable. So there are some benefits to VMFS. So it's a little bit more simplistic, it's transparent, uh, its locking mechanism is kind of important. It uh, does allow for a direct disk steady state I.O. that does result in a higher throughput at a lower CPU uh, overhead. So that's been a huge plus. The locking is handled using metadata in a hidden section of the file system. So here we actually have it as a spanned multi VMFS data store. The VMF could actually span multiple data source. And again, how we actually access it is gonna be through that hidden metadata. Data stores, these are always kind of important because sometimes you get questions dealing with sizes. Data stores are up to 64 terabytes for a single uh, extent. Data stores uh, built on multiple extents are also limited to 64 terabytes. Data stores do use a block of one megabit, megabyte per second. Sub blocks are allocated for eight kilobytes compared to a typical 64 kilobytes for VMS version three. Also virtual nodes for RDMS are at 62 terabytes. So that's always a big one. When you start looking at data stores and when is it 64 terabytes versus when it, is it 62 terabytes, if it's, an RDM, if it's an RDMS, you're dealing directly with 
62 terabytes. vSphere does also have storage APIs that are uh, simple to configure. You have things like storage awareness, site recovery, multipaths, uh, data protection. A lot of these APIs can be directly configured to work with your storage device. For example, multipath and data protection I've used within a Dell MD32 and a 3800i. They just they're, they integrate very well. Storage APIs again. I don't know why we have two slides covering the same slide material, but so we also have what's called an SBPM, which works in conjunction with VASA, the principle behind the storage policy based management tool. It's pretty simple and it does allow you to build the VM storage policies. That way we can have a little bit more control of path IO, access IO, um, things of that nature. B or sorry, SPBM is a storage policy base management tool. The bulk of the uh, power of the storage policy comes from the interaction. That way it's all automatically gathered and the storage capabilities from the underlying arrays. So that's always a huge thing. So configuring the storage at the VM layer, we could be doing that using uh, our virtual volumes. So the virtual volumes allow for us to build features and placement policies uh, within our VMDKs. That's our virtual machine disk. So there are some of uh, volume types we need to understand. Things like a VMX, a data volume, which is a VMDK, a memory volume, which is a snapshot, a swap volume, which is just the swap files. And other volumes could be like vSphere's uh, specification like VRC. Policy attributes, disk type, encryption, deduction, replication, quality of service, the I.O. policies, the read-write policies, the latencies, backups, high availability, fault tolerance. So different policy attributes. The important parts for our volume types are going to be our config, data, and memory volume types. Understanding what a VMX is, understanding how that differs from a VMDK, again, the the configuration versus the data volume. We have one more major topic, which is how do we actually store our virtual disks? Yes, they're VMDKs, but how do they work? So we come in three major formats, thin provisioned, thick provisioned, and thick provisioned has both lazy and eager zeroed. So what does that mean? A thin provision disk, while you may allot it, let's say 500 gigs, and you actually only have 100 gigabytes of data, gigabits of data, gigabytes, big B. Well, the actual footprint for that storage is 100 gigabytes, where with a lazy zero disk, it doesn't pre-zero unused space, so an array with thin provision will show only 100 gigabytes used. So we may actually do a thick provision where it will try to provision out the full 500 gigs, but if we're only using 100 gigs, then that other 400, gig, uh, that other 400 gigs of storage is not pre-zeroed, so the storage may show that as unallocated or unused space. Thick provisioned, eager zeroed, it consumes the full space. Even if we have 100 gigs of data, it will pre-zero the remaining 400 gigs and hold it. That way, all of our storage is accounted for. That's actually this chapter in a nutshell. I want to thank you.